So if you have a Bible, I would encourage you to go ahead and open it up to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And uh, we will start in verse 23, where we left off last week. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 23. So uh, we talked, we started last week this section where Jesus was pronouncing uh, woes upon the Pharisees and the scribes and his critics, his enemies, the people who were standing against him trying to uh, undermine his ministry, trying to discredit him in the eyes of the people that Jesus is trying to help and trying to save. And uh, the, the woes, as we noted last week, are a very significant kind of prophetic curse that gets lobbed at the, uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and all of the people who are present. And you'll remember that he had been engaging with them and then when he begins the woes, they're still there. So he's not doing this distantly so that they can't hear it somewhere. He's doing this to their face, right? He is, he is doing this to their face. He's pronouncing this prophetic woe, this prophetic curse upon them uh, to their face. And we got through the first three of the seven woes, and we'll uh, complete the last four today. So and the big idea is very simple. Jesus continues his prophetic pronouncement of woe against his enemies. So nothing hugely surprising there, I think. But if you're following along in your sermon notes, your main point number one with your fill-ins is this right here, number one. The enemies of Jesus receive the curse of woe because they misapply God's word. The enemies of Jesus receive the curse of woe because they misapply God's word. Now, they are the people who you would think would be the most studied in God's word, right? So, uh, in that time, in that place, and still in some places this way today, these are the guys who would have the entirety of, of the Old Testament memorized. Okay? They should know it pretty well. And yet, the problem doesn't come in their having the content of it memorized, stuck in their mind. The problem comes in the how they apply and interpret it. And this is what Jesus is pronouncing woe on them on account of. So Matthew 23, verses 23 through 24. This is the next of the woes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. That's a fun word picture, isn't it? And we'll get to exactly what he's talking about there. But let's go ahead and kind of work through this. So he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, which is this common uh, statement of woe that's at the beginning of pretty much all of these seven woes. And the hypocrites, we talked about them. That's the, that's the word for actor or play actor people who would wear a mask, who, who would be something else on the outside than what they actually were uh, in reality behind that mask. And that's the, that's the accusation that Jesus is making, that you guys are false, you're fake, you're phony, you're not real. You are presenting something to other people that you are not, that you are not. And so then he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You have, quote, neglected the weightier matters of the law. There's, they have this hyper-legalistic focus on minutia, which then tends to, uh, or, or, or then results in them completely missing the heart and purpose of God in what he has revealed. Right? He says, you tithe, mint, and dill and cumin. 
You tithe out of your spice rack. You are so hyper-vigilant about the tithe command that you go to your, uh, well, how much of this do we have? All right, we'll pour it out here. We'll measure it out. We'll cut out this much. We'll set that aside. Next one, do that over and over until, all right, let's take that. Now we'll tithe that. That's how hyper-focused, according to Jesus, these people are in following particular parts of the law. He says, you're so hyper-vigilantly focused on this minutia, but you have missed, and neglected is the word he uses, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law. Now let's make a quick distinction here. When Jesus says there are weightier matters of the law, he's not saying there's bits of the law that are important and there's bits of the law that are unimportant. He's not saying that. He's saying, however, that there are primary things. There are first things. There are weighty, important things that are getting shoved aside in favor of things that are minutia. The, the things that are of not unimportance, but comparatively somewhat less importance. Because he doesn't say you shouldn't be doing the tithe thing and then doing this. He says, no, you should have been doing these other things while still following the rest of the law. Now, he might, he might have a, a talk with them at another time, perhaps, over whether or not, all right, should you really be like tithing your spice rack here? Is, is this what the, the intent of the law actually was? He may have had a different discussion with them on that point, but we don't have that in the text, so we don't, we don't camp there. But what we do have is Jesus coming along and saying, you guys are missing the whole point. You're, you're trying to do the particulars as particularly as you possibly can. At the same time, you're missing the whole heart of this thing. You are rejecting the heart of God, and this is the essential, what Jesus is getting at here. And, he, and then he defines what these weightier matters are. He actually lists three things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Now, what Jesus, I believe, is doing here is he's actually quoting an Old Testament prophet. He's quoting the prophet Micah, Micah chapter 6, verse 8. And it's got a slightly different feel, uh, perhaps here, than what, the way he puts it, but it's very, very similar. Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness or mercy, some translations say, and to walk humbly with your God. Well, you can't walk in faithfulness if you're not walking humbly. So justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These are essentially the same three things that Jesus makes note of in his accusation to the Pharisees that they are hypocritically not actually following the law. They're not doing what Micah has said. This is what God requires of you. This is what God requires of you. Live this way. These are the outcomes of a life that truly follow God. And the Pharisees are absent them. The Pharisees are absent these qualities. And then he brings this word picture, this fascinating word picture, to conclude it. He says, you guys, you're straining out a gnat, but you're swallowing a camel. Now, with, you're going to fly, trying to help me illustrate gnat. <sighs> awesome. Uh, so we have this picture. Now, why, does, why picking these two things? And, and sometimes the assumption has been, well, a gnat is very, very small, and a camel is very, very not. They actually have something else in common in the Jewish law that is a larger part of the point. Both the gnat and the camel were considered unclean dietarily. So you're straining out a gnat, but you're swallowing a camel. Well, sometimes what they would do is if they had their beverage, their wine glass or whatever, they would have a covering 
over it to keep gnats from flying into their drink and them perhaps accidentally swallowing it. They were straining out a gnat. They were straining out a gnat. They were, you're, you're, you're taking care to take care of this small problem, this small uncleanness, but the problem is the reality is that you're still participating in the uncleanness. You're still swallowing a camel. Now, they're not literally eating camel. The point that he's making here is that they're still not in compliance, actual compliance with the heart of God and his law. You don't, you don't do that and still say, well, I'm righteous, I'm faithful. Well, justice and mercy and faithfulness, these are the things that are actually absent from them. This is what Jesus is saying. And how do they get here? By misapplying God's word. They're saying, well, look, it's all about following all of these minutia laws. I'm tithing my mint and my dill and my cumin. I'm, I'm tithing out of my spice rack. Look how dedicated I am to following this law. And, and Jesus says, you're missing the point. You're misapplying the law. The point of the law, the thing that the law was meant to drive people toward, was justice and mercy and faithfulness. And he says, you guys don't have that. That's not in you. And, you know, kind of to prove that, these are the guys who, like, go behind Jesus' back and get him crucified. There's no mercy in them. They're committing murder. That's kind of like one of the ten. That's no faithfulness. They are bringing an innocent man on charges later on. Well, that's not justice. So justice, mercy, faithfulness. These are the three major key things that these guys are all absent. And it all shows up in the crucifixion of Jesus because they're all in violation of all three of those as they participate in his death, as they contribute to his death. So this is why when we talk about misapplying the word of God and being serious students of the word of God, it's, number one, very important. And number two, it's not just about, well, I've got to get the minutia down. It's about, well, what is, what is this point driving toward? What does Jesus want us to see here? What does he actually care about? And if we're not doing that, we're misapplying the word. And we don't want to be people who misapply the word. Number two. The enemies of Jesus receive the curse of woe because they favor superficial change rather than heart change. They favor superficial change rather than heart change. And this really builds on or in some way explains why they have the problem with the misapplication of the word from our previous point. Well, the reason that they don't apply the word appropriately is because they're simply interested in the superficial, the external. What is it? Does it look good? Rather than is the heart changed? And you'll notice how often Jesus talks about things like, well, the heart. You know, go back to the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard it said, do not murder. But if you hate your brother, perhaps you have murdered him in your Heart, You have heard that it said, do not look at a woman lustfully, or do not commit adultery. But if you look at a woman lustfully, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. What Jesus is coming to change is the heart problem, because that's where the, the root of sin is, from the control room of the person, the heart. Jesus comes to change that. But these guys are more about keeping the superficial than seeing the heart be changed. Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 through 26, starting in verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, 
but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may be clean. He says, you clean the outside of the cup, you clean the outside of the plate. All of their energy, all of their attention, all of their devotion maintains only a superficial appearance of faithfulness or obedience. I'm being externally obedient. Okay, what happens, or what do you call it when somebody is obedient on the outside, but on the inside they're disobedient? Do you know what you call that? Disobedience. You call that disobedience. I had a friend and a coworker who had a, a kind of an interesting phrase to describe uh, practicing this when sometimes, uh, you're like, you know, you're, you're at work or whatever, and your boss gives you. Uh, an instruction, and you know that that instruction, if you follow it, is going to cause all sorts of other problems. And if you've had it up to here with your boss, you do it anyway, because you bring about those problems. And the, the, the phrase that he used to describe that was this, malicious compliance. Malicious compliance. You obey externally, but the heart behind it is disobedient, is disobedient. This is what they're doing. They are cleaning the outside. They're making the external look good. Follow what has been, quote, instructed. But then he says this, on the inside, you aren't that. You are full of greed and self-indulgence. The reality hidden behind the false front of obedience is completely self-seeking. It's, I've got to get what I want out of this. So I'll maybe comply, but I'm going to comply to get what I want, not because it's the right thing to do. I will obey because I think in obeying, then... I'll be treated like a good little boy, good little girl, and I'll get my treat. That's not Christianity. That's legalism. That's legalism. I obey to grow. I obey to become that which I am not. I obey not to get out of it. I obey by the power of God, by the presence of the Holy Spirit working on me, not to get what I want, but to simply become obedient. To love God in the way he has put out for us. To, to, to not just do, but to be. Not just do, but be. He says, first, clean the inside so that the outside may be clean. So what is Jesus saying? He goes, you guys have put the cart before the horse. You've unprioritized this thing. You have taken the external and worked on that, but left the internal a mess. You've left your heart in disarray while you have simply fixed up and polished the superficial. Cover rat poison in chocolate. You still got chocolate-covered rat poison. Let's change what's on the inside. Let's change what's on the inside. Let's do work with God in our heart so that we are not rat poison covered in chocolate, but so that we are the people God would have us to be. 
so that we are the people that God would have us to be. First clean the inside, that the outside may also be clean. The clean exterior only means something if it truly reflects a heart that has been washed and is working with God rather than against Him. Let's not just be the exterior people, but let's be people whose hearts are changed. Let's work on our hearts with God, not just the, the exterior. Number three, the enemies of Jesus receive the curse of woe because their superficial righteousness deceives others. All right? So this is progressive here. All right? This is the next part of the progress is that you know, they misapply the word, and that misapplication leads to superficial rather than heart, and that superficial rather than heart then begins affecting other people. It's not just you anymore. And, and whenever you hear somebody trying to justify their sin, or justify their wrongdoing, or their wrong behavior... One of the things you will commonly hear people say is, well, it's not hurting anyone else. False. Because a, a bad change in your character will affect other people. Period. That's how it works. Because guess what? You've got influence. There are people who look at you and look to you and if you're messed up on the inside, but not too bad looking on the outside in terms of being obedient or doing that which is, looks good or looks right, we're not just talking about physical appearances here, we're talking about somebody who isn't what they portray themselves to be. It's going to have an effect, and it will deceive someone else. It will deceive others. Matthew 23, verses 27 through 28, starting in verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You are like whitewashed tombs full of uncleanness. It's more than a heart that's just kind of like a little bit off. We're not talking about a little problem. This is, despite what the outside looks like, the entirety of it is still unclean. It's still unclean. Jesus uses the picture of a hidden tomb in another one of the Gospels to describe somebody who stumbles over it and in their contact with it because of the law that says, don't touch the dead bodies, make themselves unclean. The problem with the whitewashed tomb is that it's something that looks pretty good. But the reality of it is that the people who come into contact with it are still influenced very poorly, are still influenced very poorly. It's entirely unclean. Sin thoroughly corrupts. He says, you outwardly appear righteous. You are full, however, of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And I'll stop for just a second with that word lawless, because that's actually a fairly important and weighty word here. Because one of the other times that Jesus uses that word is in his Sermon on the Mount, toward the conclusion in chapter 7, when he talks about people appearing before the judge of the universe on the last day. And it says, they will say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do all of these really good things? And the response... I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Lawlessness is a description 
of a person who is out of control in their unrighteousness. They're not just, well, that person's got a couple of problems. No, that person has major influence with their unrighteousness, and it's affecting other people. Because notice what they say in the Matthew 7. Didn't we do all of these things? And they talk about helping other people. They've roped other people into it. They've brought in other people into their deceptiveness. They're affecting other people poorly. They're deceivers. So the problem is with the superficial, fake, phony righteousness is that it doesn't just harm you. It harms everyone else that's around you. If you go all the way back to the very beginning, go to Genesis chapter 3, and look at after they've eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they were instructed not to eat. And then God is describing to them how not just they are affected, but how their relationships beyond themselves are affected. He says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. He says, this relationship is going to be very difficult now because of what you've chosen. It's not just you who, he says, you're going to have pain in childbearing, you're going to have these problems. But not only are you going to have problems, you're going to have problems with somebody else. And there's only one somebody else at that point. It's her husband. Which means their relationship is going to struggle. Hey, guys, have you ever argued with your wife? You're like, well, yeah, when I got up this morning, I, yeah, <laughs> right? Like, it's a, it just happens sometimes. You're like, what happened? Where did that come from? Because this is what sin does. It affects not only us, but it affects those who are around us. To Adam, Adam, he says, all right, you are going to have this, you know, this pro all of these problems. But he says, and then there's your work. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your bread. And the, nat the, the ground will produce thorns and thistles, and it'll be harder for you to do your work. And he's, uh, obviously, uh, we're talking agricultural here. But it, 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 it develops. It cultivates. It grows beyond that. Because that was the original command. Cultivate the earth. We call that the cultural mandate, which also includes create culture. But what happens when you create culture, when you add more people to the mix? Well, guess what? When you put one sinner with one sinner, you got two sinners. When you put 100 sinners with 100 sinners, what do you got? All kinds of nuttiness. It just, it compounds. It gets worse and worse and worse. Which, oh my man, maybe we just, I don't need a savior. You need somebody to deal with this. And so Jesus comes to deal with it. Not just so that you can go to heaven when you die, but so that that which is broken can begin to be repaired. Jesus cares about more than just the geographical location of your soul in the universe. He wants to repair that which is broken in us. That's why we have this daily process in the Bible called sanctification. That we can grow every day. We can change every day. We can take steps forward. We can actually become more and more holy. That's why Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit to indwell us. Part of it was, that's where sanctification comes. The, the word sanctu, that's making holy. The Holy Spirit is what makes us holy. We need the Holy Spirit. We need each other also. That's why we have all of the one another commands in the Bible. There seems to be several of those. 
We ought to pay attention to those. He says, you, though you're whitewashed tombs. And then he says this, you know, others are, are seeing this and they're being deceived. They, others will look at you. And so others are getting roped into this. And this is what Paul says in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And verse 5 is what I really want us to notice here. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Now, stop for just a second. That whole huge list that he just went through, lovers of self, lovers of money, disobedient, heartless, unappeasable, uh, ungrateful, unholy, all of that. They're the people he just described as having an appearance of godliness. Well, how can you be that and appear godly? Pharisees didn't seem to have trouble with it. That's why he called them hypocrites. That's why he called them actors. Because they have this mask they're showing everybody else. But behind that mask... They're all of these things. They have a form of godliness. A superficial, external only view of being holy. But the reality is, is that behind that superficial, there's nothing holy. What, what Paul describes there in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, is an unregenerated heart, is a heart that doesn't have Jesus, is a heart that is against God. Whenever Paul has one of those really long lists that look like that, it looks like there's a nasty drunk, junk drawer, because he's got several of those throughout his writings. He's always describing an unbeliever. But here, he's describing an unbeliever who is presenting themselves as a believer. Which is what Jesus says going back to Matthew chapter 7. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not? But I will say to you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And he, just previous to that, describes them as wolves in sheep's clothing. Oh, they look like sheep. But underneath, they're ravenous wolves. Paul does the same thing in uh, Acts chapter 20. He describes it very similarly. So that's the problem. That's the problem. That misapplying the word that looks like it's just one little problem in that first woe that we've covered today, that's a signal of something way bigger. It's a signal of something far larger. Number four, our last one. The enemies of Jesus receive the curse of woe because they will be responsible for persecuting God's true people. They will be responsible for persecuting God's true people. Verses 29 through 36. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you actors, for you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate the monuments of the righteous, saying, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witnessed against yourself, yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. You fill up, then, the measure of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Therefore, I send you prophets and wise men and scribes, some whom you will kill and crucify. 
And some you will flog in your synagogues and persecute from town to town, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of the righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the sanctuary and the altar. Truly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. He says, you guys, you say, if we had only been there, talking about the prophets, the, in the days of the prophets, and the prophets were not treated well. Now go read Hebrews, go read the books of the prophets, go read the Old Testament. When a real prophet of God shows up, that prophet usually incurs a touch of trouble. And persecution against them happens. And you guys say, he says to them, well, if I had been there, I would not have done that. We wouldn't have done what our fathers did. And Jesus' response to that is very simple. Yeah, wrong. You absolutely would have. And you know how Jesus knows? First of all, he knows because he's Jesus, right? And he just seems to know this stuff. Because he's God in human flesh and he's got access to knowledge. Second of all, because he knows what they're going to do to him. He's fully aware of it. He's not surprised by that. Whenever you, you kind of see moments in some of the Gospels, it says things like, he knew what was in their hearts. Usually around a time when somebody's pretty darn angry at him. And like rrr, rrr, grumpy, bitter, you know, all of these. Rrr. This is a description of these people. And he says, look, you guys, you would have done that. He says, you witness against yourself by saying that they are your fathers. Well, you're gonna, you, they, you are their children. You are the heir of their perspective. And you do the things that they do. An arrogant and boastful, or this is an arrogant boast of personal greatness. We would not have done these things. Jesus schools them by pointing out the family resemblance to their, quote, forefathers. Then he says to them, I will send you prophets. I will send you wise men. I will send you scribes. And why is he going to do that? In part, he's doing it to prove his point. In part, he's doing it because the world needs to hear. And he says, I'm going to send them to you. And some of them, you're going to kill. Some of them, you're going to flog in your synagogues. You're going to have them whipped. Some of them, you're going to drive out of your towns. Because this is who you are. Jesus will further prove it. By the way, his messengers will be treated after him. Which, you know, if, if you're a real follower of Jesus Christ, doesn't that make you just like a little bit nervous? <laughs> like, hmm. Yep. And, you know, maybe it should. Because we, we have this sort of, sometimes this flowery pie in the sky kind of outlook that does not match the biblical record and what the Bible says. Jesus, in, in the Gospel of John, says to his disciples, shortly before he's arrested to be crucified, he says, they hate me. They're going to hate you too. They're going to hate you on account of me. And the, the reality is, the reason they do that is because they're not with God. They're not with God. I'll tell you this. As somebody who's been a pastor for 17 years, I have had more trouble with people who claimed to be Christians than with people who claimed to not be. I can verify this experience. This is what he is talking about. He's talking about people who, as Paul said in 2 Timothy, 
they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of it. So he says, I'm going to send you prophets and wise men and scribes anyway, because you need to hear. And the people need to hear. And this will prove what I'm saying. And then he says, so that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on earth. Jesus is the last great prophet. He's the culminating point. He, he is the last in a line of prophets and the great one who comes to deliver the message of God. And it's the message of God's salvation and God working and bringing his kingdom into the world. And they are getting ready to kill him. They're getting ready to murder him. And so this moment that's coming up, he says, this is the culminating point of all of the persecution of the people of God that's ever happened. And you're going to participate in it because this is who you are. And upon you will come this culminating moment. Their bloody mistreatment of Jesus is the climax of the unjust deaths of the righteous from the very first. And he, and he lists Abel and Zechariah. Now, do you know what he's doing there? Abel is the first human being killed. Well, in the Jewish canon of the Old Testament, uh, the books of the Jewish Old Testament, are, they're the same books, but they're arranged differently. Well, the last book in the Jewish canon, 2 Chronicles, and the last person, righteous person to be killed in 2 Chronicles is the guy he mentions. So from the first to the last, he says, uh, he, he said, this is the spectrum. You've, all of this is going to come upon you. You are at the culminating moment of all of this, from the very first to the very last. His death will compound the guilt of the unrepentant guilty, while it simultaneously forgives those who repent and place their faith in him for salvation. So he says, woe to you. And so when you see that word woe in the Bible, all of the things that we said last week and this week inform the weight of that one three-letter word. That's how important that word is. So when you see that in your Bible, understand that it's invested with all of that. And so perhaps if you're reading Revelation one day and you see a figure say, whoa, 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 say it three times. So they repeated things for emphasis because they didn't have italics or underlines. That's how, they, that's how they emphasize things, by repeating them. So when they say, Lord, Lord, did we not? They're emphasizing. When the figure in Revelation says, whoa, 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 that's a super mega whoa. That's a big deal. But do you know who we are? We are the ones who are the recipients of such a great forgiveness that the woe of God has been removed off from us. We have been rescued from the wrath to come. We have been rescued from the wrath. The woe of God has been decisively dealt with on behalf of those who have truly placed their faith in Christ, who have received eternal life from him, and who look to him on love. This is who we are. We are the forgiven. We are the forgiven, but we will struggle with those who have woe. Because that's who they are and that's who we are. But let us be people of forgiveness. Let us be people who share the gospel, who invite others into that forgiveness. Because this is who we are. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the great good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you that you save us, you rescue us, you bring us restoration. You not only will take us to heaven when we die, but you work to repair and restore and renovate us now. Help us to be at work with you, receiving what the Holy Spirit is doing in us so that we show ourselves not to be the people of woe, 
Thank you, God, for your love, which is contrasted with those statements of woe we have read over these last two weeks. Thank you, God, for your grace and your mercy and your justice, the weightier matters of the law. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. All right. Well, let's go ahead and...